My name is Renaud. I'm a software maintenance engineer at Red Hat since six years. And if you didn't guess from my accent, I'm French. So as a software maintenance engineer um, at Red Hat, I'm specialized in RHEL. And I'm dealing most of uh, troubleshooting customer cases that are related to user space. So services that, that can be systemd services, systemd, uh, yum, uh, yum DNF, uh, RC's log, so a lot of things. And usually to troubleshoot issues, I love to use S-Trace. And I will tell you why. Uh, but because this talk is for beginners, I will go very simply on explain you how S-Trace works, uh, how, when S-Trace can help you, and when it cannot help you. And basically, we go through dissecting uh, what S-Trace outputs, and I will go through examples of five or six cases where you can use S-Trace and how to use it. And finally, we will wrap up with some SE Linux integration stuff. So what is S-Trace? <coughs> so uh, for the guys that already followed the S-Trace sessions, they know. So please be quiet. <laughs> uh, S-Trace is a tool that enables you to see uh, which system calls are executed by your program, your user space program, and prints back their value. So it works. Uh, you can have many, many options. Below are the options I'm using. For example, I'm always using dash F flag to follow forks. That is when a program spawns children or spawns threads. I'm using TTT uh, to print various timestamps in uh, human readable format, I would say. So some hour, minute, seconds, milliseconds, and then uh, uh, delay uh, in the syscall. Uh, I'm using MV because I like to have decoding, much decoding of the syscalls. Uh, S for to specify the, the buffer size uh, of strings, and YY to decode more stuff, basically. And when you want to attach to process, I will show you that later, of course, you can use P flag. So uh, S-Trace is, I said, it's all about syscalls, <laughs> but uh, what, is, what are syscalls? So basically, so syscalls are a way to interact between your user process and the Linux kernel. There are other ways that I won't, uh, I won't tell here. So basically, he, uh, every time a user process requires access to a resource, it uses a syscall internally. And this is code is, is wrapped in a glibc function, basically, for errors checking and other stuff. Uh, for example, when your program, which can be C or Python or anything, calls open, you have it internally somehow will call sys open, which is a syscall associated to that. When you, there, usually there is a simple mapping, but not always. For example, when you create a child using fork, it's not for that is used anymore, it's more sysclone. clone. But, well, you can have a list of all the syscalls available on your system using syscalls to man page. So when I put that in brackets, that's the man page, uh, the section, and you have a list, it depends on the architecture, and when you want to do more uh, about the syscall, so I just show you that you just use man on section two, and then the name of the syscall without the sys underscore prefix. So how does it work, S-Trace? So S-Trace uses the P-Trace interface internally, which somehow sets a breakpoint on the process that you are monitoring, that, that we will call callee. So every time a syscall is entered, the callee stops, and S-Trace gets a notification. S-Trace collects the data it wants to record, for you, for later, and tell the callee to continue. The syscalls happen in the kernel. Upon returning, the callee stops again. S-Trace collects the rest of the data, 
for example, the number of bytes it's, uh, it wrote uh, to the file system and stuff like that. And uh, S-Trace prints you back to standard error or usually to a file some nice lines that, you will, that will help you troubleshoot, usually. Uh, one thing to note is that you cannot have two colors of the P-Trace interface at the same time. That is, if you are already attaching the process to GDB, you cannot trace the process uh, you, you attach to. Usually it's not, it would be nice in some cases, but well, it's not the case. You cannot do that. So when, uh, when this trace helps, but basically it helps when syscalls are involved. If there is no syscall, it won't help you. So basically you can have common hangings, so by hanging we say you start something and it waits forever, you don't know where, it prints nothing, so that's a common hanging. Program waiting hanging, that's almost the same, but usually it's more when uh, the network in involved, is involved, for example. Uh, you can use this trace to find, when you don't know a program, to find which file is processing, opening, reading, writing. That can be very, thing, uh, very various things. It can also see, help you see which libraries are, are linked to the program. For example, if, you, if uh, some customer set uh, LD library pass, you will see that other library can potentially be be open and be used and that make your program fail later. And also if you know nothing about what you are trying to troubleshoot, you can also perform some kind of reverse engineering of the communication between uh, your, the program and the rest of the world. Uh, last thing is you can sometimes um, understand what triggers some specific error, but usually you have to check with the source code and try to first to, to match where the source code is and get more. So more use cases, but that, that are the use cases I mostly am dealing with. So as I said, a stress is of no use if there is no syscall at all. So if it's doing if your program is just spinning on the CPU, there is no syscall involved for that. It won't be of any use. If a syscall is not returning from the kernel, so hanging in the kernel, it won't help much. It will just tell you that when this syscall with, for example, this file descriptor or this file is being called, you hang forever in the kernel. So in such case, you have kernel tools such as trace CMD, that can help, it's more touchy, and it's kernel things, basically. Uh, s trace may not help you when you have some issue related to some race condition. For example, you have your program with multiple threads, and um, something is misbehaving. Usually, s tracing will hide the problem, which gives you a tip that potentially you have some issue with some race condition, but that's all. Of course, when a um, program dumps core, it's race of no use. And when a program exits just because it wanted to exit uh, due to some internal computation, it won't help you because you need always these calls to be involved, basically. So recommended usage is not really recommended, it's my recommended usage. That means that when my colleagues as stresses uh, to customers, but they don't want to, to analyze the stress by themselves, they send it to me, and I like that they use these flags, basically. So stress has a lot of flags. I can't tell how many, maybe they are useful stuff, but not for me. I, uh, actually, I didn't read all the man page of stress yet in six years because it's too long. So there are too, too, too many uh, possibilities. So, uh, when you want to trace a command and it's still run, you use FTTTVYY, for example. Dash O will uh, store the result to a file. Dash S, which is 32 by default, is how long the strings trace collects. Uh, uh, it's collecting, it's 32, it's too small to me. Usually now I use 128. 
Here I put one, one K, it's good enough, but sometimes it's, well, the larger you specify this, the bigger the stress will be. And once you have a gigabyte of uh, just one file of S trace to analyze, it's not that optimal. So usually to my peer, I say 1,024 uh, 1, and it's good enough. Uh, you can stress, so first case was I start my command under stress. The second case is I want to attach a stress to a specific program. The difference here, uh, I'm not sure that will work, so it's using dash p. Dash p, you can switch multiple processes. Um, just be aware that if you attach to a program and the program already spawn children before, of course, you won't monitor the children. Um, when a process obtains, uh, gains root privileges, for example, sudo, uh, don't forget that uh, to run S trace as root already, otherwise, of course, you won't see anything once the program became root. So for me, for my job, that's easy. I, I always do S traces using root, whatever the problem is. So now that we have the basics, let's see the output. So the output depends on the flags you use. So for all these outputs, it's FTTT VYY, okay? So first you have the PID. The PID is a thread ID of the program that you are expressing. Then you have a timestamp with hours, minutes, microseconds. Then you have the syscall name and the syscall parameters. And then, at the end of the line, you have the equal sign means the syscall returned, and you have the result. So the result is dependent on the syscall. Can be zero, can be something else. Depends on the syscall. And at the end, very end, you have the time spent. So I think that is a big capital T here, but I'm not that sure. So here, for example, in that example, we will enter the people syscall, which was written on some descriptors, and it returned on timeout after 900 milliseconds. Uh, for those that use a VI, you can set a uh, S-trace uh, file type uh, so that you get some nice colors. Uh, that's it, so two examples here. Um, from time to time you get, well not, it's not from time to time, usually you get unfinished resume thing. So basically, in the previous example here, we had the, the syscall on one line, one after the other, but it's far from being always the case. For example, you will see this kind of thing. So the PID, the timestamp, the syscall, and unfinished, and later, in some other line, you get the result. So this happens when you have a multi-threaded program, usually, or you are monitoring more than one, one PID. Uh, so that's completely expected, but it can make analysis difficult. Uh, I think there are some tools available on the S-Trace uh, website to pack things, etc. But uh, honestly, I'm never using that. Uh, S-trace, so many syscalls return minus one. Minus one is usually an error. Uh, is, that, is that bad? Well, it depends. Uh, there are many syscalls that are designed to fail in error. For example, when you try to access a file and the file doesn't exist, it will return minus one and set the erno, and the erno is set to no such file that way, so in a way. So, for usually the Erno that you can skip, and because they can make you think that reading SOS is difficult, are uh, E again, E intrypt, E restart sys, and E restart no end. E no end, no such file directory, usually it's perfectly normal, except, for example, if you try to exec, uh, execute uh, uh, um, an executable. USA has been, has been through and doesn't find it. And so here in that case, uh, usually 
the shell will try multiple location if you use just foo as the executable and not the full path name. It will try various places where to find the, the, the program and in the end may fail or not. Um, another example, the program tries to open some library which doesn't exist. It says no sulfide data, but it continues, so there is likely no issue. Real issues are usually when you get EPERM or e-access, which means I couldn't access a resource. Uh, something I didn't tell is that S3 also catches signals and it prints which signals were received by your program. So here in the example uh, above, we see for example that PID 6138 was doing a select, so it was waiting for something on the network, for example, or just sleeping, and it got a sick kill, so it was killed. And that's it. Uh, you have other examples with sector 6 uh, Six sector, it <coughs> gives you, so when S3 processes the signal that was received by the colleague, um, it prints you details because of the dash V, I think. So here, typically, it says that you have six term received and it was from the user space or some other process. And here it prints who sent sick term, that was PID1, so system D, and then uh, how it was running basically, so as would. Uh, sometimes you get sig uh, signals from the kernel, for example, so here that's the case where the kernel killed the program because of a segmentation fault, so it, and there was, the program tried to access address Null, so it was a null pointer dereference. So S3 shows you a lot of things that are very interesting to troubleshoot, basically. So let's go with to the examples. So I have six examples, basically. So um, S tracing a command slowness. So typically, so I have I see that all the time at customer on customer systems. Basically, they execute a command and it's slow. It works, but it's super slow. It takes ten seconds. With a stress, it's very easy to see what's going on. So in that example here, uh, we were executing DF, and because uh, execv syscall also knows the environment variables and all that stuff, it prints the environment variables, so I skip it, and we can see, for example, that this DF program had in the environment LD library pass set to some SAP directory, which is not an issue. So you can check the man page from here and see how this was, how to match between the things. Yeah. So here we have the pass name, yef, then the arguments, yef, dash a, dash h, and then the rest is environment. So it's in brackets here and it goes to the next. So when you see something, this is a real example, basically, in the program. So it was taking a long time, so 10, se uh, 10 seconds to execute DF. And for its place, we, can, we could easily see that it was processing the LDA very fast because it tries to open LIPC in various locations, which it, it couldn't find, which is not a problem because uh, LD will then try other paths. But the issue was on the time span to find out that there was no file. 400 milliseconds to scan a location. At that time, a trace is of no use anymore. But you know where to dig into. Basically, you have to check why accessing US SAP fails, but takes so much time to fail. And basically, for the small story, uh, it was failing here because of some Ottoman that was happening in the background and breaking. I, don't, I see that I don't have the complete presentation. Too bad. Okay, um, another use case is S-tracing 
SSH being slow or hanging. This happens all the time. When doing so SSH, you need to remember that you have two parts. You have SSH and you have SSHD on the server you are accessing. Many, many times I see people sending me traces of SSH. As such, SSH does nothing. It just connects to the server and that's the server that, that does the job. So always remember to trace the server inside. Uh, instead. Usually I, uh, I now ask also to extract the client so that it's easy to match the timestamps and to see the connection, the port being used and stuff like that. So how do you extract the server, SSHD? Well, I give you some tip here. Basically, I get the PID of the SSH server, which is Unwell and Fedora I stress, I start a stress, I tell the customer to do the SSH, and then to control C a stress once uh, he considered that it was too slow, basically. And then I check it. The other way to do that is to, that, that means that a stress will stress all the activity uh, of SSHD. So all the connections, even the, the one you are not interested in. So sometimes I ask the customer instead to spawn a new instance of SSHD just on a specific port, 8022, for example, and connect to that. But I don't like that. I don't do that much because the issue is that you need uh, no firewall and no uh, open port and SA Linux to be configured to, to allow that, and etc. And finally, so we get uh, our S trace from the server, and we check it. So initially, we, we search for accept. Accept is a syscall to accept a new TCP connection. s shows you all the details. It shows yeah, the port on the local, uh, on the local system, so it's uh, on, the local, on the client. And our, it's always 22 here because it's our SSH server. And some lines later, we see a clone. So basically, we have SSHD fork a child to handle the connection. So search for this, search for clone, and once you have the clone, you know that you are interested in this process and its children. But usually, there is no need to check for the children. It depends where the issue is, but basically, you extract from the biggest trace you have all the children, this, the PID, 23918 and all the, uh, the children, and then you can dig into that. So I'm giving you some, but I have better since then, basically. That's the thing. Uh, if you use uh, the uh, SSH listening on alternate port and just listening for one connection, there is no clone because it's a uh, handler that will, so the, the SSH service just for one connection that will handle the, uh, the, the, the new connection. So what we have here? Well, that's a real example. As you, uh, so sometime later in that S-trace of our SSHD connection, we can see that some message is sent. This is a diverse message from create session, blah, blah, blah. So this is pump system D running to create a session for the user. No issue with that. So it's sending and then it answers, it waits for some answer. The initial answer is the again, which is, hey, I have nothing for you because you are, I'm in non rocking mode and return immediately. And then we can see the code doing a people, which is basically waiting for, uh, for getting a notification that there is something to be read on the file descriptor for, which is used for the connection to Dbus. From there, so we know that, so, and we could see that the, the poll uh, syscall failed in timeout after 25 seconds. Uh, once you have all this, you know that you are done. Basically, there's some issue sending the message to systemd to create a session. It waits for 25 seconds and then it continues. 
then of course you need to have to know some internals that SSHD internally executes the PAM stack and in the PAM stack there is PAM system D which is responsible to set up the session, etc. So basically here there was no connection to uh, system D lobby D which is in charge of telling system D to create uh, the session. <coughs> Uh, S tracing sudo uh, and su, so program that become root. You have to proceed differently because, as I said, if you are not root already, when you execute S trace, you won't see anything once the program becomes root. So, what I do is I S trace the shell that the user will use to execute the sudo command. So, I get, I use equal dollar dollar to get the PID and then I attach. S trace to dollar dollar. I tell the customer to execute his command that fails or is slow. Usually we use studio SU, which is a bit redundant, but that's a life. And we get some S trace. When you want to S trace a debug, for example, cron, well, you can attach to it and wait for cron to execute, basically. So that's very easy how to manage things. Uh, a common mistake is similar to SSH is when you want to trace a failing systemd service. So I see people all the time stressing systemctl command, which basically does nothing as for SSH. It just talks to systemd and systemd does the work. So to, uh, to have something useful, well, you have to trace systemd. So PID 1. So procedure, you trace systemd, you, you start the service, you control uh, the trace of systemd once you consider that the service failed, and you check for, you try to extract from the biggest trace you get because systemd was doing other things, what is interesting. So what is interesting when you have to find when system, CT, system CTL was executed, basically, to say, hey, start this service. Well, how it works is very similar to SSHD. You have some exit for syscall on the socket, on the Unix socket. And later, you see systemd creating a child for clone. And later, again, you see systemd, so the child of systemd, executing your service. Such case, S is Basically, you will see as many exec, exec VE as there are, so as many children as well, as there are exec start pre and exec start pro, uh, commands. Then you need to extract. I have better tools, as I said, with grep, blah, 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 blah. And then you can dig into what you want. Uh, that was ancient times, so I was doing all manually. Now I scripted everything. So basically, you get the children of, you get the child of systemd, and then, and all the child of systemd you are interested in too, and then you recursively extract all the children of your service. In this case, it's spawn, spawn, spawn. Uh, you can easily check using the strays as well if you could see some proce process or some services being killed or that failed with error or no error by just breaking, basically. So uh, some people will say, yeah, OK, you do a US threat system D, you get a mess, and then you do filtering. Why doing that? It's because, well, there's another way is to hack the service unit and just replace S is of D here by S trace, your command, and S is of D. But that's bad. That's bad because on rail you have SC Linux, and because of that there, there will be some automatic transitions happening. We have S trace being labeled with bin, bin T, and systemd execute as init T. So if when systemd forks the child and starts executing S trace and not S C D, you will become so S trace will become unconfined service T. And because of that, S trace will then start S's log, 
and SCSOC will run as unconfined service T, which is not appropriate for SCSOC. So probably your service won't fail because it's open bar, let's say. Whereas for SCSOC, which is supposed to execute in SCSOC DT context, it can, it can do less. So that's why never hacking the unit type and just relying on stressing CCNA and then filtering. Uh, five minutes is perfect. So, <laughs> stressing boot activity. That's very similar to stressing system D, basically. This happens, so I do, I do that rarely, but from time to time. I want to stress the entire boot activity when I have no choice, basically. I can see for, for time to time that a service fails to start at boot, but once you restart it, it works fine. Why? It can, be, can have many causes. Usually, it's due to when you boot, you have no network. If it's a service that starts early, you have no network, or you have no DNS resolution, you can have the network, but still no DNS resolution, and stuff like that. So the, the, thing, the easy thing to do is S-trace systemd as soon as you switch root, so that you get everything. Of course, your system will start slowly because S trace has a huge impact, but you get everything. And then you filter and you're good. So this is a small trick to do that. You mount, you will mount because after just switching wood, you have nothing. So first you put with init slash bsh, so, that, so uh, you get the prompt at switch root. I will mount in slash with a red white. And then I execute S trace, but somehow Especially with capital D, so that it becomes a grandchild. Why? It's because we want to have system D be PID1. If we were just doing S trace, blah, 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 system D, S trace would be PID1. And this thinks that it works, but in fact, because PID1 is special and is used to, to reap uh, processes that have no parent, it won't work. So use this, start it. So it's, it, you will have your, your nice system you're running and all the children, all the services, are, et cetera. And once you can log in, you have to kill S trace forcibly. Otherwise, it doesn't work. I didn't, I didn't check exactly why. I think there must be some signal handling issue, basically. And last uh, thing is on SLinux integration. Dimitri already said it yesterday. So uh, with recent S-Rays, you have SNLinux integration. That means you can see, that's very interesting when you want to learn SNLinux, you can see transition happening when you execute uh, services. This is an example with RC's log. When you put dash dash SC context with nothing, you, you have very small things, very small indication here. We can see that our, the child of systemd that will execute our syslog, which is this PID, initially execute uh, in the context of the caller, which is systemd, so init t. And then it, it tries to execute our <coughs> syslog, which is labeled differently with syslog d exec t. And this results in the next line, when exec v finish, this result to change context to syslog dt. So, if you start S tracing with a second text by hacking the service unit, you will see that you won't get this at all. You will become unconfined service T, which is bad, basically. So uh, it's uh, on Fedora 36 and later, rel 8.4 and later. And for ancient guys that do not have this, I have on my public space some rebuild version of S trace. The latest at that moment I did. So it breaks a bit but with SC context integration there. So it breaks because some decoding is not aligned with the kernels, but that's of no, not much interest. And that's it, I'm done. Questions? Looks like you are no beginners. <laughs> What? Uh, you provide a link to a, a separate 
Uh, yeah, yeah, that's just uh, I, I use uh, the, the upstream S trace uh, and just rebuilt it for SC, SC context. Yeah, so it's just private benefits that I give to customers sometimes when I need that on rail 7, for example. No question? If you have question, you are shy, you can, uh, we can talk later. So, for the early Oh, so the question is, uh, I'm writing to a file when I want to trace the boot activity. Could we do that for serial console? Well, yes, you can, because I think the serial console is already set up in slash dev, so you can stream it. But, well, writing to serial console is never good because it's super slow and it, uh, it's synchronous. So writing to a file is nice. And also the phase will be huge because you have may maybe 30 or 40 services running initially at boot. Yeah. Yeah, that could be nice, yeah. So not to touch Okay, yeah. As, as long as you you uh, backport it to Rail 7, uh, that's great. No. <laughs> I'm interested. <laughs> okay. I suppose team members are supported here and there. Okay. That's it.